due to the declared local health pandemic. I will now call this meeting to order and ask Hattie to call the roll so we can verify the presence of a quorum. Hi, Margaret. I know you sent me an email with a list of folks who can't be with us, so I don't, but I don't know where that email is. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> like I thousands. So if, if I call their name, you might want to just scream with me. I will okay. do that. Thank you. All right. Terry Ann Jones. Present. KJ Starr. KJ. Mary, new grandma Mary. She is not here. Kozar Mohammed. Kozar. She usually comes late. Lisa Nakotra. She is not coming. Anna Arkin. Hmm. Anna, are you with us? Adam Jaffer. Here. Alicia Jackson. Alicia? I see her. She's Alicia, amazing. you're on mute if you're trying to speak. Maybe she's having a day too. Laura Rampart? Yeah. Jerome Evans. I'm here and I just want to point out that Alicia uh, messaged in the chat that she is here. Andrew Crook? No. Rick Culp? Here. Linda Felder? Present. Meredith Martinez? Meredith could not come tonight. She's on vacation. Craig Hedberg? He is not coming tonight either. Babette Applin? Oh, I don't. She, was she one of them? Yeah, I, I don't remember getting anything from her, so maybe she'll come yet. Aaron Hurley. He's just coming on right now. I'm just admitting him. Aaron Hurley, are you with us tonight? You are on mute. And Julie Pujabi. Here. Okay. Um, KJ Star. Kosar Mohammed. Anna Arkin. Here. Okay. Anna is here. This is Babette Appland. Okay, there are 11. We have a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Hattie. Uh, so per usual, we're going to talk about the minutes from last month, and then we're going to do one roll call vote approving the agenda and the minutes. So any questions on the minutes from last week or last month, rather? OK, any question on the agenda? Great. Um, Laura, will you give us a motion to approve? Um, I make a motion to approve the agenda and minutes. Awesome. And then Andrew, will you second, please, since you're unmuted? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Go for it, Hattie. Hey, Terry Ann Jones. Approve. KJ Starr. KJ noted that she's having trouble getting in. Okay. Mary is not here. Hozar, have you joined us yet? Anna Arkin? Yay. Fatima Jaffer? Yes. Alicia Jackson? Do we have a chat from her? Um, she is on. Alicia, are you able to um, both hear us as well as speak? It does. It looks like you're not on mute. Let me 
meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, Laura Ransgard. Yay. Jerome Evans. Yay, and I'll um, I'll mention that Alicia's tagged in and she uh, approves the minutes and the agenda. Thank you, Andrew Perk. Approve. Brett Call. Approve. Wanda Felder. Approve. Babette Appland. Aaron Hurley. Approve minutes. And Jolie Punjabi. Approve. That's passed. Awesome. Thank you very much, Hattie. So um, we're changing the agenda up a little bit uh, this month. Generally, we would hear from our deputy commissioner uh, towards the end of the agenda, but this time Noya is coming up first. Um, Noya, are you present? I am. Wonderful. Please go for it. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Margaret kindly provided me a list of things that you would like to hear about. I'm going to start with a few things and then ask, um, Hattie, are you able to share that PowerPoint? Yes, I will. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few other things and then we can switch to the PowerPoint. Um, so there was a fair number of questions about the ongoing COVID work and the vaccine for specific groups. Uh, the first variant, and of course we are seeing elevated uh, case numbers related to the variant, and it is really um, the variant to which we can attribute the bulk of uh, cases that we are having here in Minneapolis right now. There's nothing different that we are doing in response to the Delta variant other than making sure that our communications on our city website and any social media pieces that we do um, address the Delta variant. There was also questions about third doses and booster shots. And just so there's some uh, clarity in case people don't know that, there is a difference between the booster shot and the variant. I I'm sorry, the booster shot and the third shot. The third shot is for um, individuals who are immunocompromised. Their first and second shot did not uh, provide them as much protection that um, those of us who are not immunocompromised receive from the first two shots. So the third shot in many ways is just to catch them up to have the same amount of immunity that uh, we have from two shots. So uh, the CDC has now come out with recommendations to um, provide that third shot to those people that are immunocompromised. Our recommendation as a health department is that those folks first attempt to go to their primary health care provider in order to get that third shot. We will provide third shots at the clinics that we are hosting if people come in asking for them. Uh, we won't turn them away, but really all of our communications around the third shot is directing them to the um, to their primary care clinic. The booster shot, we don't know yet. We anticipate that this fall we will get further direction and guidance from the CDC about a booster shot, but we don't really anticipate that we'll hear anything until October or November. And the booster shot is for anyone who's been vaccinated. Um, it just it extends the life of the immunity for the, uh, for the vaccination. 
Uh, the other thing that I wanted to note that you uh, you all didn't ask about specifically was the approval of the vaccine for children under 12. We anticipate that that will come in November. And um, we are already talking about whether or not we will do any uh, uh, special clinics in conjunction with the school system or whether or not we will open up our existing clinics to children under the age of 12. Uh, we don't have an answer for that yet, but we do know, uh, we, you know, we anticipate it and are, are doing some conversation about what we will do when that happens. Uh, the other thing is that just yesterday, the FDA gave uh, approval to the Pfizer vaccine, um, like full approval. So we do anticipate that we'll get a little uptick in uh, the number of people visiting our vaccine clinics as a result of that. Um, and then um, if we could get that PowerPoint up, I will start covering that. Noya, while that's coming up, there was a um, message in the chat. Yeah, I was going to verbalize my question while we were waiting for the PowerPoint. Noya, um, I've worked with a lot of people who got the Johnson & Johnson shot for the vaccine. Has there been any discussion or guidance around folks who got the J&J &J around if they need boosters or second doses or anything like that that you've heard of? Uh, we haven't heard anything specifically about Johnson Johnson in terms of the boosters. We do anticipate that there will be a booster recommendation for all three of the existing vaccines that we have available right now. Okay, thank you. And also, welcome, Kozar. Hattie, I just want to make sure we uh, adjust the uh, attendance records to show that uh, Kozar made it. And then just a reminder that we can't use the chat for commentary. Um, uh, Aaron did mention that if you took the data from the emergency use authorizations, it would constitute a very large phase three um, trial. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, we're out. PowerPoint is up. Go for it. I just wanted to note that oh, um, Anjali has her hand up. Oh, I apologize, Anjali. Uh, sorry, I was just typing my question in the chat too. I was wondering if we know if folks will need to get the same the same vaccine type for their booster that they got upon their first vaccination, or if we can mix and match at this point. Right now, what we're hearing is that you will have to get the same vaccine. So if you got Moderna the first time and um, there's a recommendation that there be a booster, you'll have to get the Moderna again. Um, all right, so this is a, a kind of unattractive PowerPoint, but I just threw it together Monday morning for a a meeting that we were uh, having where people wanted to hear this information as well. So I thought I would go over it uh, today. Um, let's see. All right, if you can go to the first slide. So we are still, even though we're not any longer in our incident management structure, we are still doing COVID work. and. I think that's kind of the overriding message of, of all of this. I think there's um, some Im impression uh, with, I'll say within the city that uh, the IMT is gone and so no COVID work is gone. Well, that's not the case. I can attest to that because it still consumes most of every day. <laughs> we continue to do case investigation and contact tracing. Uh, these names you see associated here are um, for internal purposes, just so people know who to reach out to about these separate issues. We're stu still doing logistics, which is mostly distribution of PPE. Um, we are not doing testing events, but we do have tests available for our community partners. 
Uh, we are, of course, doing vaccination and we are continuing our public information and outreach work. Next slide. So our case investigation and contact tracing has always sat under Louisa, who is our manager of EPI research and evaluation, and that's where it will continue to sit. Uh, we continue to follow state guidelines about whom we should do, we should be doing contact tracing with for um, what type of COVID, whether it's um, uh, regular COVID breakthrough, the variant, whatever. We have started having conversations with some of the other ju jurisdictions, though particularly um, very beginning conversations with the EPI team at Hennepin County about whether or not we should uh, consider kind of breaking free of the state recommendations about contact tracing because staffing continues to be an issue for doing contact tracing. Next slide. Uh, logistics, so uh, again, first bullets just more for our internal purposes. We do, uh, we had a COVID email address where we were directing all inquiries about COVID. We've discontinued or shut down that email address and now we are directing all inquiries to our health email address. And then from there, they get distributed out to um, the appropriate person. And actually Hattie does a lot of that for us. Um, requests for PPE are now coming to me and oh. I am uh, calling on other folks in the health department to help uh, get that PP out to the appropriate people. Um, we will continue. One second, is there someone on the phone who should mute if you can? Your last, last two digits in your phone number are 28. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Noya. All right, thank you, Jerome. Um, so we, we will continue to distribute PPE as long as we have a supply. We have not yet decided whether or not we'll repurchase and um, restock our supply, but we have still a, a fairly good number of masks, both the N95 and the surgical masks, and we have uh, a fair amount of um, hand sanitizer yet. So, and we're deciding on a case by case basis uh, how much we'll give and to whom. Uh, there had been a long standing request form that we asked people to fill out. We're no longer asking for that form to be filled out, but again, directing people to the health email address. Next slide. Uh, testing, um, again, another directive about who to call. Uh, so, we had a number of tests that required uh, you to have a Zoom appointment with a medical provider in order to administer the test. Uh, we have the option to switch those over to non-Zoom tests, so we are doing that so that we can just hand them out and people can do the test and get it sent in and uh, take care of business on their own. Most of our tests have been distributed out to community partners. We have a small supply that we've hung on to. Um, you know, for instance, last week I went and picked up 15 and took them to a restaurant that had asked for them so they could test their employees. Again, requests for tests should be directed to the health email address. Uh, vaccination is the is kind of uh, the meat of what we're doing, and um, it it's still a pretty intensive body of work. So prior to COVID, any immunization or vaccine work that we did fell into the maternal and child health division. And so that's where we've just decided to place our ongoing vaccine work. And Stephanie Graves, who's been the branch lead for vaccine for a while, just um, as M MCH coordinator, has taken on responsibility for the ongoing vaccine work. As we move forward, we will be incorporating flu and measles immunizations into our work. Um, and of course, we will continue the, the COVID. Uh, we have a number of staff that are still helping to make the vaccine uh, operations function. Uh, there's a few of them listed there that specifically work on vaccine and then all, all of our site leads continue to uh, provide support there. Uh, next, there we go. 
So here's just an org chart actually that Margaret helped us put together that uh, describes how our immunization work is going to continue. So Stephanie as MCH coordinator slash manager will oversee an immunization vaccine coordinator. I actually uh, met with our HR classifications person this morning to get that position, that new position classified. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to post that in a few weeks and uh, get someone hired permanently into that position. We do have a temporary part-time person filling that position right now, uh, just because we need the help. Uh, the other branch that you see on this chart, community engagement and outreach, I'll talk about it a little bit again later, but um, we are merging some of the public information and outreach work that we were doing into this immunization and vaccine area. Uh, so we, I, I am also going through the process of getting these positions classified. So there will be a community engagement and outreach coordinator, and then there will be outreach workers. And we are at this point, uh, planning to fill an outreach per worker position that is geared towards the East African or Somali community, the African American community, and the Latinx community. If and when we get enough resources, we would add someone that is uh, specific to the American Indian and Asian community. These folks will be charged with making sure that accurate and timely information is getting out to uh, specifically our communities of color. Uh, we are still experiencing disparities in rates of COVID, in hospitalization, in deaths, in vaccine uptake uh, for all of our communities of color, but I would say more so in the East African, Somali, Amer uh, African American, and uh, Latinx communities. So that's why we are deciding to target those three communities first with the outreach. We also have had a set of MOUs with uh, five community-based organizations that are culturally specific organizations that have helped uh, help, helped us uh, spread the word about COVID and about testing and vaccine. They are our quote trusted messengers in the community and we will continue those relationships and this group of people will be charged with managing those relationships. And then um, Hattie's in the process of hiring an additional person to her team that will provide some administrative support to our immunization and vaccine work. Next slide. Uh, so the public information and outreach uh, the, like I just said, the bulk of this work will fall under the immunization vaccine umbrella. Uh, we continue to work with city communications to make sure that the information we're sharing on the city website and through social media is accurate. Uh, just yesterday I met with them to talk about our messaging around the third shot and uh, boosters and anything that we know in, in that regard. Uh, Patty and Kristen continue to work uh, on communications as it relates to the updates that Gretchen continues to do to City Council. And then um, we do have a plan to hire another person. I haven't started on that position yet, but we will be hiring another person that will be uh, helping to create some of the communications materials. I think that's it. Yep. So that's the um, that's the COVID work that we continue to do. That's how it's structured. That's where the bulk of it is landed. Um, the last question that uh, I was asked to respond to was any policies at the city level that are being put in place that could impact COVID. Uh, the main one under consideration right now is whether or not to mandate vaccine for city of Minneapolis employees. We um, have been considering this probably for about six weeks. The main barrier for us at this point is the cost. And there is some give and take, some push and pull, if you will, about whether or not we should, if we were to mandate vaccine, of course there would be 
cause for people to not comply, but then they would need to be tested on a weekly basis. That push and pull comes in with the testing. Do we say, um, like our friends across the road at Hennepin County say, hey, you're on your own. We want to see a test result every week. You go figure out where to get tested and come let us know. Or do we provide testing opportunities for the employees? Um, as far as we know, and we know that our, our records are not 100% accurate, but um, our, our best estimate is that about 60% of city employees have been vaccinated. So we're talking about 40% who, um, if they don't comply and get vaccinated, we would need to make sure that they get tested every week. So really there is a cost issue and a logistics issue with, with figuring out, um, do we mandate the vaccine? And then more importantly, how do we backfill that for those folks that still choose to not get vaccinated? And um, HR, the mayor's office, uh, city council, um, health department are all um, kind of working with that idea and trying to you know estimate what costs would be for the for the test testing alone we anticipate that it could cost $15,000 a week. So that's not manageable long-term. So that's the main policy issue that I would say we're dealing with at the city. And then I, I feel like I'm out of time. Is Am I right on that? You are exactly at um, the minute. No, okay. Well done. Were oh, last one, last question. Yeah. I almost forgot. So, um, the health equity manager position has closed and uh, HR is reviewing all the applicants and then they hand them over to me so we can figure out who to interview. I'm looking for a volunteer from PHAC to sit on the interview committee. If no one wants to volunteer at this moment, could you please just communicate that to Margaret and she will let me know who is willing to help with that. I, I don't I'm anticipating that we'll interview seven-ish people, maybe. So at 45 minutes a piece, you know, we're looking at a, a solid day of, of time, uh, probably split between a couple of days uh, spent uh, with us doing interviews. Okay, Noya Alicia Jackson has um, stated in all caps that she would love to volunteer. So we'll Great. put you in touch. All right, thank you, Alicia. Wonderful, thank you, Noya. Okay, I don't see any last minute questions, so we will move forward to the next item on the agenda. Angela Watts is here with us today. Now, Angela used to serve on the committee, and now she's going to share um, her latest work or some of the latest work regarding the Hennepin County Readily Center for Family Healing. Very excited. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for that great update, Noya. You're doing an amazing job during this pandemic. You and the staff and the city. I mean, it's just unimaginable uh, what everybody has been through. So thank you for your service and for your leadership with that. And thanks to Stephanie Graves. She's my partner in justice too, and I haven't seen her in over a year and a half. It's just unbelievable. We always stay in touch in some capacity. And um, I'm just glad to be back. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, not everybody, there's some faces I recognize and some new faces. At one point I did serve and work in the Minneapolis Health Department. It was a great experience for me. Learned a lot and in a, in a lot of ways put me on this trajectory. So for this presentation, I'll be sharing with you what I'm doing in my fairly new role as the Director of Operations for the Red Leaf Center for Family Healing. And we have several connection points with the city of Minneapolis that I'll point out and we can talk, save more for discussion. But uh, if Hattie can pull up the presentation for me, we'll get started. So I'm gonna start by saying the Red Leaf Center for Family Healing is named for a real family, Lynn and Andy Redleaf. They are um, a very philanthropic family, and they put the initial seed money or challenge grant 
for building the new Red Leaf Center for Family Healing. And like any family that donates to a cause, you have a personal connection and the story and it's public information. Lynn Redleaf, the wife, um, she had her first child at what was HCMC. So that gave that connection. She's also with our co-founder, Dr. Helen Kim, has a strong connection with her. Dr. Kim is the medical director of our mother baby clinic. Dr. Kim has been with Hennepin Healthcare for it's hard to believe she's been there that long, over 20 something years, because she's a fairly young physician, but she's a perinatal psychiatrist. And what that means is she came out of Boston Mass 20 something years ago. She was doing that pioneering work on women in postpartum depression. It's a little bit more normalized now, but if you can imagine 20 years ago, it was a real stigma. It was shame and blame on mothers who couldn't normally attach and bond with their children, feeling really isolated, you know, some to the point of suicide. So she did a lot of pioneering work with this. And so Lynn Redleaf really helped stake some of her initial mother baby clinic over the years. Like, what would you do if you had this, Helen? She said, I would do this. And then when they really got in some money as their wealth increased, they were like, what would you do with some real money? She said, I want to build a center that's about healing. Uh, Hennepin Healthcare is known as a trauma one trauma center, meaning it's a physical trauma center, as you know, for motorcycle injuries, you know, car accidents, those uh, gunshot wounds, those type of physical um, uh, ma ma manifestations of, you know, violence. The Red Leaf Center is about that small p trauma, that psychological trauma. So Helen said, I would want a comprehensive center focused on trauma, but we don't use the word trauma. You, we use the word a future state of healing. So our center is about family healing. And so Helen wanted to go from that mother baby diet to really looking at how do you heal whole families and communities uh, through this center. So next side, slide, please. So I want to share with you our journey of how we got there. And years ago, Gretchen actually said in a couple of the meetings that we were first talking about from a community perspective, what would that look like around trauma? So now all of our organizations are kind of looking at trauma. I know Hennepin Health, Hennepin County is looking at trauma. The city is looking at trauma. Hennepin Healthcare is looking at trauma. We're all finally weighing in on this. And um, communities are openly talking about it with some of the things that are happening in our community from Mr. Floyd's death and Jamar Clark, just years and years of trauma and just pain um, manifesting in our community. How do we move toward a more healing philosophy? So for us in the Red Leaf Center, our healing philosophy is this. It's really born out of the knowledge that families and communities are their own best source of meaningful and lasting health and well-being. And that we believe that equity is advanced through trauma healing and resistant, resilient skills building. So we believe in drawing from the wisdom and experience of community. Even though Dr. Kim is a physician, she doesn't really overly rely on that Western approach of, you know, top down medicine. And we also believe at the bottom that rather than create more systems, the work and progress of the Red Leaf Center is really focused on connecting with and building on the deep cultural responsive healing expertise and experience that already exists and is trusted across generations and within communities. So one of the real draws of me really working for Dr. Kim and our other co-medical director, Dr. Cuts, who's the chief of our pediatrics, is that she's probably the most unpsychiatrist I ever met. She'll look at other things before going to medication management. She'll look at bio gut. She'll look at um, iron deficiency if they're fatigued before going to, you know, treating uh, symptoms like that. Next slide. So this slide I actually have as a handout for you, so I'm not going to read everything on it, but it's kind of our version of our one pager about everything about the center in one easy to read document. If you can scroll down a little bit more. I want to get to the mission first. Scroll down to the mission, the top. Yep. So the mission, our mission is this. The Red Leaf Center for Family Healing saves and improves lives through multi-generational mental health integrative and parenting support services for pregnant and postpartum mothers, fathers, and families raising young children. Again, we've evolved our language from mother-baby, that whole diet relationship, 
to thinking about birthing parents, particularly fathers who self-identify as fathers, that whole family experience. We know from our research that when moms come in and they're not at their best self or dealing with depression, fathers also go with that too. 10% of our fathers also uh, report being depressed and really not having a place to go to be able to express that as men uh, who are dealing with that and having support, you know, the mother or the wife or the partner in the relationship. And we achieve our mission through three through six principal ways in the color boxes that are horizontal. I'm not going to read everything in them, but I will talk a little bit about each one. One is our multi-generational mental health and parenting support. So we are part of HCMC, but we're more of an outpatient clinic, which means that you can come in without being admitted and receive support and services. The second box talks about family support. We don't call it per se parent education. It seems kind of top down judgmental for a lot of communities, but it's about how do we support you and your parenting experience, particularly in this time when parents have to serve as teachers and be the one stop support center for all their children doing when we were doing remote learning and everybody's kind of doubled up, no escape, you know, during these intense times of the COVID restrictions, a lot of parental distress we were seeing. Another component of the Red Leaf Center is a teaching kitchen. We got this feedback from our families that they wanted to really know how to do hands on cooking and prep, not that iron shelf type stuff that you see that's more like I call food experience where you really don't do it. But what does that mean for me as a new mom or a new parent or a new dad to really think about nutrition and my health? We know from I used to oversee the WIC program that when children are born with iron deficiency, the mom had it and passed it on to the baby, right? Then you wait for the child to go get that first well child exam. All this time has passed. And if that iron deficiency is mitigated, that leads to school problems and, you know, learning problems. So really going further upstream with mom and baby, looking at bile gut level, looking at iron deficiency, nutrition and rich foods. And we're really partnering with Appetite for Change in the community to do some of our community programming around that. So in working with Appetite for Change, we learned about a program in California that had a public health approach to trauma-informed food security not just because of COVID, because of distance in California, they've been able to show huge gains through Facebook Live classes where whole families sign on, learn about nutrition. It's real interactive. They got a great platform, put you in Zoom related breakout sessions. So we really trained for about three months with this team out of California to look at trauma-informed approaches to nutrition, as well as how do we begin to weave in and integrate principles of mental health and well-being around food, from family rituals to experiences, because food is a big cost item in a budget now with housing, so families feel really stressed around that. Then integrative health and services. Uh, we've always done trauma-informed yoga, deep breathing, and all those things because trauma gets in the body, and how do you begin to have that mind-body movement and experiences? Uh, Dr. Kim has always referred for acupuncture and chiropractic services, but now because we have the space, we'll have those services under one roof and have those um, practitioners be able to come in while the moms, dads, and parents are already on site. So we're working through that now with COVID. Then the innovation and collaboration hub is really about how do we work with communities and other organizations to share learning with you and learn from you as we begin on this healing experience that's rooted deeply in community knowledge and expertise. And then the training and research arm, the University of Minnesota is a community partner for us doing this. You know, the U opened up that, um, what is that, Zero to Five Brain Institute. So the Red Leafs are part of funding that too. So we have some connection with the U's uh, new program. Then as you look at our desired outcomes, just very briefly, we want to be able to improve client health and well-being through trauma-informed multi-generational models of care because it gets passed on from generation to generation. And through this process, this self-recognition and healing process, we're really mitigating that transmission. We want to be able to discover and disseminate critical learnings and demonstrate for us as a new center, particularly in COVID when everybody's budget is crashing, right, particularly in healthcare, financial and organizational health. So this is a handout. You can read it more in detail, some of the other metrics of success. So next slide. 
So what's really important to us, like I said, uh, recognizing that we do work with medical providers who understand their limitations too, even though we're one of the largest teaching hospitals in the state, we know that we don't know everything and that this one-sided Eurocentric approach doesn't uh, all, always work for multiple communities. So we wanna work alongside and work with and build with community. So th this particular slide <clears throat> is more of a snapshot of some of our essential partners, but not all. So for example, Washburn <clears throat> is a critical partner, mainly because they do that infant mental health. I don't know if everybody's familiar with the field of infant mental health, but it's really about that parent-child bonding and attachment, the well-being and the mental health of the child from prenatal you know, to birth. And so they have a very unique specialty around that. We're also, and I know Wanda Felder is on the call, we're uh, working with Minneapolis ECFE to really begin to bring classes on site to the Red Leaf Center within our hospital, drawing from our birthing center to our pediatrics, to our family medicine, really begin to have families the opportunity to engage early with the district and programs that support families, uh, prenatal experiences along with their early child development and working with a Latinx firm called New Publica, they did a lot of engagement with us. So this is another touch point that we're going to have with the health department and hopefully with this committee. We reached out to fathers and dads and self-identified partners to be able to say, as we expand our mission, how do we begin to think about incorporating you to make a commitment to include that? And so we did a series of listening sessions in the midst of COVID. It was really critical, but hard to do. Drawing from some of our pediatric uh, department fathers who come in for well-child visits, uh, looking at some of the key informants across you know, our communities, and I think Margaret knows this, and I know you may know it now too. I know Stephanie will remember that early work that we did with dads and with the father project all came back full circle, right? The need for fathers, the needs for dads to be incorporated. I can send you the research, some of our findings. It wasn't a true uh, focus group because we couldn't pull it together because of COVID, but we did do a lot of informational interviews. We did YouTube videos together. And it really changed the narrative about how we think about BIPOC fathers. They're saying the definition of a deadbeat dad is a dad who has the resources and won't stand up for their child. The dads we were talking to, like, I'm working two or three jobs out here as a first responder doing these jobs that nobody else wants to do in the middle of COVID, trying to make ends meet and trying to support my child. That's not a deadbeat dad. That's a dad who's trying to give his best effort. And we just don't make it easy. They even gave us really critical feedback and needed feedback about our pediatric department, about how if they even come in with the mom or bring the child for the well, they're overlooked. They're not even given eye contact. They're not engaged. <clears throat> you know, it's the assumption that it's the mom when they really do want to stand up and do the things that's going to support it. And getting that early education and child development information early before they're left in a situation where they have to watch a child and they know how to respond and it's the wrong response. So some of this is just a repeat of what we've always known, but a lot of it was about a new narrative for dads who are gone through their own healing experience and really understand and wanna be vested partners in their child's development and growth. And then the teaching kitchen again, like I said, about hands-on food prep, as well as now we're exploring, we have a camera in the teaching kitchen. We can begin to do virtual programming there's a chef uh, who does the Birchwood Cafe that we recommended. He does a lot with Andrew Zimmerman. We're going to learn from him because they really do virtual. You got to be kind of spicy on camera. You got to be fun and make food look exciting to be able to engage people in a fun way, but also give practical information. And then the whole integrative health piece I kind of talked about, chiropractic services, acupuncture, uh, mind-body experiences to really begin to release and mitigate that trauma that gets trapped in the body, our research collaborative, and also the training and research. So we're really hoping that you, along with us and other partners, will really start to stand up for dads and fathers. If you look at what's happened in our community from George Floyd to some of the, these were fathers of children who have now lost a parent and they were many of them were really supportive and engaged in their child's life. And so we're seeing this pattern of generational trauma that we want to mitigate now with so many dads, you know, and then the suicide rate among men is up again too, particularly during this COVID time. So there's so many things that we can do along that uh, path, but really uplifting dads and partners and families during this time. Next slide. 
So this is the red leaf theory of change, and it should be familiar. It's not new information. It's really based upon the Harvard Center for Developing Children, along with a lot of family input and support. So even though we're ground scientifically, scientifically in research around self-regulation and executive functioning, that's kind of common knowledge now around self-regulation, executive functioning. Those are just core skills that adults and children need to be able to make it through life. How you regulate, how do you respond, all those things. But as you know, this committee being public health, when you're under immense, immense trauma and persistent trauma, that gets really short-circuited very early and very quickly. And then capacity building. How do we begin to support children and adult mental health and parenting relationships so we don't pass that on, that we can break that cycle? And then our approach is though trauma-informed and both multi-generational and grounded in community. We believe that healing happens in relationships. So when we have those relationships, we have those experiences in that group setting, we have seen phenomenal results. And then both the short and medium term changes that we see in the program is increased child and adult capacity building and the ability to self-regulate and seeing those executive functions, those connections really being made. And both pregnant and parenting adults begin to nurture, protect, and mutual delight in their children. And we use the word delight, and we know no parent delights every day in their child because <laughs> things happen. But to be able to see and notice your child in a new way through some of those milestones, and some of those are hard developmental milestones, but they are, they are needed and necessary. So putting things in context for parents and giving them the support that they need through this parenting experience. And then the long-term changes, which is part of the health department's um, Mission and Vision 2 is really healthy brain development for children, long term generational well being, trauma healing, and resilience. So, that's kind of a snapshot, an overview of the program in a really quick way. I had wanted to send you the architectural renderings, but they were copyrighted, so I couldn't send it through a public forum. But what I decided to do for the next phase of the presentation is what I call like, the Wizard of Oz, more color, to begin to give you just a snapshot of how we designed the center. So when I was on this public health advisory committee, I was really stressed because in the daytime, I was trying to figure this out with people. And then as we got into the crux of really building, COVID happened. So we were trying to do this remotely with architects, with project managers, with the builders, with the regulatory people, the city regulatory people. It was crazy, but we, we pulled it off because as a city, you build all the time. As a county, you build all the time. But um, some of my colleagues from Hennepin County, uh, Hennepin Health here, we build what once every 50 years. That was a CC at CSC. We don't build that much to have that much competency and to do it in COVID. Oh my God, it's amazing we really made it. So what we did, it wasn't a new build. It was actually a parking lot that uh, where doctors parked that we refurbished and kind of like a new building with costs that we turned into the Red Leaf Center for Family Healing. So the next slide. So we took a trauma-informed approach to everything about this space, from the design to the layout to the furniture, and we got deep family input into everything about the space, the furnishings, the fabric, the coloring. We had samples of chairs and tables brought to the offices where they were to be staged and have families come in and sit and test it. And so we used a trauma-informed approach, meaning we wanted to hit emotional targets of safety, Connecti connectivity to bring in uh, factors around joy and delight and support to be able to do that. So when you walk into the public space, it's the first thing you're going to see is this tree. It was a commissioned art piece, but it goes back to our metaphor of change, meaning that healthy soil produces vibrant, colorful, plentiful leaves. Toxic soil produces these other types of leaves. So within it, you may not be able to see, see it, but embedded in the tree are different artifacts that the staff brought in, that family brought in from childhood. Mm -hmm. There are things like lockets and, and baby shoes that what the artist kind of uh, wove into the, uh, the mosaic piece. And it's really meant to be interactive. Once we can fully have an open house and invite you and others, you can be begin to leave welcome messages on the leaves of the tree. So when we have our grand opening or open house, uh, when we're able to meet in person, we'll have people begin to leave that for the cohort of parents that are coming behind us. 
So the space is meant to be open, wide hallways to bring you in and get you delighted about this space before you enter into the, uh, the corridors of the building. So next slide. So now you begin to enter into the space. And while it's a clinic, it's kind of not a clinic. It has more of a community feel to it. So what the uh, architect tried to capture once again is that whole uh, trauma-informed design and approach. Tons of art. I don't know what was going on with the art community under COVID, but they unleashed a lot of creativity. All this art here is original art from local artists from diverse communities, and, and they came out and really supported the center and these families. So this is the space while you're waiting to see someone. You can see the chairs are wide, seating is circular, the space is meant to connect, and those green and kind of gray things hanging from the ceiling, those are called baffles. It's meant to make sure the space isn't like a box, but it has some movement and some fluidity to it. And the coloring itself is neutral, but with pops of color to begin to make it not so trauma that you're like fall asleep, but you're engaged and you feel soothing, welcome and connected. Next slide. So as you begin to enter into the clinical space, tons of art once again, so I'm going to point out the mosaic of the family. Those are little small tile pieces that the artist created to show once again the connectivity of the family. They're kind of sitting in a circle with create with uh, which once again represents con connectivity, safety and security and joy and delight. And every time you look at the mosaic, if you really see it in person, when you're able to come in person, you see something different in it. It's a bird in it. It's a deer. I mean, so many hidden things in it that's be able to delight you when you come in. And then to my left was a little uh, paper that looks real colorful on the board. Once again, it's meant to be an interactive art engagement piece where the next cohort of parents can leave messages for the final cohort and just keep the circle of connectivity and engagement going throughout the life of the, of the program. And you'll see how the hallways are wide, neutral paddles with pops of color to begin to engage you as you come into the space. Next slide. This is an actual photograph of our group room. And in the original mother baby program, it was a small program. We only had 1,200 square feet. People outgrew that real fast over an eight year period. This is 10,000 square feet. So in this one, this is an actual photo. We're right down by the stadium, as you can see. And this is a circle of the group room. And in the old space, they always had rockers. Families chose these modern gliders. You can actually glide, sit back and kick it back in that space and once you're in that room you're really self-contained we have a lactation refrigerator a regular refrigerator tea service coffee maker food snacks everything weighted blankets to really get you calm and comfortable in the group setting um, floor to ceiling windows even though we can pull down the privacy shades for client confidentiality but it's meant to be open and engaging next slide I'm going to draw your attention to the top. Once again, those are called baffles, those gray and kind of light bluish uh, circular forms. That's meant to represent, along with some leaves kind of interwoven between them, that's meant to represent like a tree canopy, like you're sitting under a tree, under your rocking chair, just relaxing, engaging in this group, coming together as parents, sharing your experiences. You come in hyper alert trauma. We're going to calm you all the way down, bring you down to a natural setting where you can relax. There are lockers there. You can put your purse, whatever you need there. And then that open door that you can't see all the way in that room is a nursery. So moms have always been able to bring their babies 12 months and under. So there's a nursery right adjacent to the group space where moms can have their babies in there. We have what we call the baby holders. This is our volunteers who are nurses or whatever who can help watch the baby so moms can get fully engaged in their healing experience, but still be in proximity of their little ones. Next space. This is the space that surprises everybody. Whenever you come for a full tour, this is the last thing I show. 
because at one point we were trying to do a child care space, right? But in the middle of COVID, I started running the numbers like, oh my God, this is going to hit like a quarter of a million dollars a week, right? And they were like, no, no, we want it. Like, well, what are you going to do with that space is if we can't have child care? I'm like, let's make it a family engagement center and let's make it more of a living room style. So people don't know about me is that I went to the Minnesota Children's Museum when I temporarily moved away from public health in St. Paul and I put a public health approach to the building of their new museum and I learned a lot about space and engagement. So rather than making a traditional parenting education space where we're going to just talk to parents and tell them what to do, we want to have a space where they could delight in their children, be engaged, have fun. So in this space, once you're in that door, everything is self-contained. You got your coat room, you got your family living room. You can't see around that wall. There's a refrigerator, coffee maker, tea maker. There's a big building block area for dads. There's art therapy will be in that space. We have our climbing structure. Behind the climbing structure is a parent lounge where they can relax, have coaching, connect with one another. There's a child size bathroom and a family size bathroom in there. So it's a way for families to begin to delight and engage and learn from each other and with each other. And we're really pleased I had my meeting. I know Wanda's on the call with Carrie Sawyer and Elizabeth Fields. We're gonna offer, our first offering is gonna be a bilingual parent education class, zero to five, a play and learning class in this space. And then we're also going to offer on the days they're not here a dad's program with Bruce Murray, who came from NAS and has been with MVNA for a couple of years to bring dads in. So we had him and Andre Dukes and some dads check out the space. They loved it. Like this is going to be so much fun to be able to have that. And as we begin to grow and learn the needs of men, we'll begin to explore what are the integrative health strategies we can begin to offer men or uh, birthing parents who need that as well, whether it's the teaching kitchen, trauma-informed yoga, mind-body, breathing, uh, acupuncture. I mean, there's just all kind of new modalities that are coming out that have proven to be effective for reducing stress and for uh, helping parents begin to be able to regulate and function, particularly in this climate. We say that all parents and families are under duress. So the one thing about the uh, pandemic that I think has been anything positive can come out of it is people are talking more about their own mental health and their needs and it's less stigma attached to it. We all need support on whatever level of the continuum you want to fall. So next slide. Questions. What questions do you have for me? I could have shown tons of pictures of other parts of the space, but it would have got too graphic intensive and I wanted to leave time for questions and for you to come on site when we're able to come on site. We're really thrilled to be able to showcase the space, to be able to partner with the city of Minneapolis. If we had had the opening, we would have invited city officials. Gretchen was going to speak, all that kind of thing. But we pivoted like it just wasn't worth putting families at risk trying to come down for that ceremony. So uh, we're going to delay it. And when we can be face to face to begin, either do small tours or bring people on site. So I had shown Gretchen the um, the clip of the virtual art tour that we did. And you know, I don't know if everybody knows Gretchen's background, but her dad was an artist. She was just like thrilled. You have so much water and this in here. And we were emailing back and forth. So um, this is what I've been doing since I left the, uh, the committee. What you been up to? No, I'm joking. <laughs> so this is what I've been up to. As a matter of fact, the staff just came on site, ooh, several weeks ago. I've been on site since February. Mm. just managing getting product in we had so many COVID delay supply chain issues you know with the teaching kitchen the oven got delayed then the, you know the ice maker got delayed then this so we're just happy things are coming together so thank well, you for the time if you have any questions or comments i would love to hear them i do see we're starting to have questions just very quickly thank you thank you thank you for coming and speaking with us and for this wonderful work um Really inspiring, like really fantastic. Laura, I've got questions. Or yeah, this is beautiful work. I, I want to come work for you. <laughs> um, but um, I'm really just curious about kind of what services, you know, are you, you know, where are you kind of in your, your opening and your services? Like how expansive are they or kind of what have you started with? But this, this is amazing work. Um, I used to work at Hennepin, so I'm just 
not so a you, so you know how long um, it takes to get a project like this and I do. I worked on that the community yes, just yeah. really came out and supported <laughs> it and the arc everything just came together in time, particularly in the pandemic. Yeah. So we're doing a hybrid model right now because a lot of our staff, as you can imagine, are female too, raising children too. So we have some families that we were really concerned about. Like, I got to get out of my house. I got to come see some people. I need to be on site. And we have some that telehealth really does work for them. And some, of course, telehealth does it. So we're doing more of a hybrid model. Those who can come in who want to be on site are just having an amazing experience to reconnect with staff. And those who need that telehealth support, we're still supporting them through telehealth. We believe that when school starts and some routine begins to formulate, hopefully, because uh, the majority of our, our uh, families are still moms, they'll feel comfortable with enough of a routine they can come in and make themselves a priority. But the families we're seeing are under huge distress, as you can imagine. It's just a lot. A lot fell on women. They fell out the workforce. They fell out the early childhood workforce. Child care is an issue. So we try to really mitigate all those barriers through helping provide short-term child care funding or anything that they need that will allow them to come in and be on site. And like I said, the newest experience we're going to have is bringing dads on site. So I'm kind of excited about that because the mother baby program has always been female. We've been yeah. like kind of clustered nuns, you know, in our little area. Yeah. <laughs> and now they have men on site. It's going to be like, woo, woo, let's get ready. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Wanda, give your hand up. So first I want to say hi, Angela, and it is absolutely beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. And I love your term of, of having a space where parents can delight in their children, because that is just so important. And so my question is, I'm excited about the partnerships that you have. And so specifically, like, for example, with ECFE, so are parents able to come only through their, like, referrals through their, the clinic or at Hennepin County, or like if we run across families in ECFD are screening who may have the need. Can we refer them to your program? Yeah, it's open to the community. Okay. It's not just our clinic. We made an intentional commitment that some of those spaces, whether you're a client or a patient of the Red Leaf Center, at the mm -hmm. teaching kitchen, we get the yoga up, we can be in person. It's meant to be a community space. But that, so we're excited about that. And will you have um, um, material available so, so like we can give give to parents like at a screening appointment or something yep they're finalizing the flyer now uh okay. i said carrie and uh karen and renee all of them were down this week mm -hmm. as a matter of fact today and we were mapping through some of those details around what we need to do to make sure we get the word out and you know getting access not only to our clinic but we made sure it's in the catalog as a, a site for families and community Thank you for those wonderful questions. I miss you a lot, my friend. Why did I go too. way back? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we still got another minute or two if you'd like to raise your hand um, or feel free to jump in. Angela, I will say um, I didn't have the opportunity to take notes on some of the uh, points that you were bringing up as you were going through the presentation regarding opportunities to support um, people who identify as men who are uh, parents, but there that certainly seems like an area where PHAC might be able to do some study and possibly lend support. Um, and so if you, I'll send you an email, but if you, if you wouldn't mind getting your thoughts down there, um, I'd love to see where we can take them. I think there are a couple of things you can do. I probably didn't make the connection strong enough, but the program that we're going to bring on site is really funded by Stephanie Graves and the Minneapolis Public Health Department is up for grant renewal. We're going to expand it through some of our private philanthropic funding, but we would love to see the state and other partners really invest more in the needs of men or families who identify as male partners because, and I'll send you our listening session findings because mm -hmm. the need is just, it's always been there. We're just documenting it again and again. Love to hear your feedback. Jerome and how we can really begin to support in their own healing too. It's yeah. hard for men to ask for help. So we're hoping by being in making that space delightful and engaging as they think about their own needs in a relaxed environment. Maybe they want to try some mind body work. Maybe they want to try some chiropractic services or some acupuncture services. Maybe yeah. they want to try some yoga. Well, certainly mental health in the black community in particular, it's almost like a joke about how it doesn't exist. Like black people don't get depressed. Um, and around um, childhood or children in particular, 
I know this, uh, there's a lot of interest. Maybe we can get Taraji um, Henson and her new foundation yes. associated with you somehow. That'd be cool. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Feel free to email me. I sent a video, a short video, animated video. Click the clip you can send back, Margaret. And the one pager of the broader document that I know was really text heavy, that gives you the overview of the wet Red Leaf Center. And my email if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you again for your time and all your support. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> great to see you, Angela. All right, I'm going to log off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Oh, that was really nice. OK, next up on the agenda, let me cycle back. Oh, it's the survey results. Good. OK, so um, last time I asked someone else to, sh to share the PowerPoint. I'm going to try to do it this time, and we're going to see how it goes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> My fingers are also crossed. Hey, OK. Are we, is this an acceptable mode for everyone? Okay, great. So uh, a couple of months ago, we broke into groups and you're saying no, okay, we did, we did. We broke into groups a couple of months after that, we took the survey uh, and now we have the survey results. And I went ahead and spent some time sitting with the data and there were a couple of, uh, Britt, do you need a break? Does so anyone else need a break? Does so anyone need five minutes? Just like a like stretching break for a little bit because it was, you know, it was a lot of awesome information that Angela shared, and I'm excited to shoot her some emails tomorrow because I have some people. But you know, just kind of take a brain break for a little bit before we get back into more content is what I was thinking. If that's cool with everybody else, that's fine. We um we just talked about mental health. I think breaks are really yeah. good for mental health. Oh, yeah, I good segue. It's 7.10 on my clock, so 7.15, five minutes. They were talking survey results. <laughs> Great idea. Agreed. Thank you, Brent.
One minute warning. <laughs> Okay, I am showing 7.15. So uh, because there are things on the agenda after this, we're going to get right on in. Um, like I was mentioning a couple of months ago, we broke into groups. Last month we took a survey. Uh, and today we've got the results of that survey. But one thing we did uh, last month when we were just walking through the surveys, we put the uh, issue of racism towards the end. And so your handout uh, has racism, the slides relating to racism on page 15. And so we're just gonna start there this time for a couple of reasons. One, I like to make sure that we cycle the topic areas, but then two, if you see the responses regarding uh, those who have an action in mind that the committee can take, those who can conceive of an action, those who need more information, and those who do not believe that it should be a priority. This question, the committee is um, discussing the response to the city declaration of racism as a public health crisis, had the highest number of committee members report back that they have an action in mind that the committee can take on this priority, okay? Now, I have uh, and will share out the disaggregated data so we can see what everyone um, said or how they reported, but I'm going to email everyone that said they have an action in mind to hear where those actions are. And then I believe uh, it would be a good idea to refer uh, those actions to the appropriate subcommittee for discussion and action. Okay, so that's where, that's where my head's at right now. Obviously, we're a committee. This committee is a democracy. When I have bad ideas, you can just let me know. Uh, and we'll do something different, okay? Um, now, what I don't wanna say we're gonna power through these, but we will move relatively quickly through the slides um, because like Noya, these slides are not pretty. Uh, it's just the data, okay? So 33% uh, of the committee says they have an action in mind that the committee can take uh, with regards to our response to the, dec the city declaration of racism as a public health crisis you'll see a similarly high response rate um, for systemic, for addressing systemic racism in the healthcare system. Uh, again, uh, so uh, when you sit with it, about 8% is one person um, for the number that responded. So two people have a response or have an action in mind. No one believes it should not be a priority for the committee, but there are other questions where people did uh, say that they think that some of these priorities are not for the committee. Regarding systemic racism leading to access to care, 33% of the committee is, has an action in mind, which is just beautiful to see. 41% of the committee has an action in mind regarding the, the healthcare system as a perpetuator of systemic racism. Now, I suspect that has a lot to do with how many of you are in the healthcare system itself. You have, probably have personal experience that you can draw on. Uh, so I am very excited to email roughly half the committee regarding uh, the actions that they have in mind on this priority. Implicit bias in health care, 33%. Culturally competent care, 16%. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, this is where we get to people questioning whether or not this should be a priority for the committee. Sourcing and organizing the data on racial disparities. Mixed. Two people, it look like, have an, have an action. Two people do not necessarily believe that this would be, should be a priority for the committee. There's obviously some room for nuance there. Maybe they think that we shouldn't be spending community time or committee time looking for the data or what have you. So I'll also send an email uh, to get that rationale and uh, anonymously send that information to the appropriate committee for discussion. 
leveraging data to reduce disparities vis-a-vis -vis the social determinants of health. Two people with an action, uh, some question on whether or not this should be a priority. Do note that that is one less person um, who thought, um, who responded that it should not be a priority regarding sourcing and organizing that data. And then the last slide on racism, racism as a public health uh, crisis is criminal justice reform, very broad. Um, there's also another slide, I think, relating to public uh, safety. The two are somewhat related. No one had an action in mind on an action that uh, he had to take. This is the only uh, priority under racism as a public health crisis that no one had an action item for. Cool? Okay, now we're going to zoom back to the beginning. I love, I love being able to control this. This is fantastic. Uh, then we're going to um, move to the more medicinal, let's say, um, uh, subcommittee and those questions. Issues related relating to opioids. Um, a lot of people can conceive of the committee taking an action, but only one person reported they have an action in mind. Um, so there is a lot of room for discussion there, and obviously it's a huge, huge uh, concern so i'm really excited to see what the action um, will be uh, issues relating to drugs that are not opioids more people had an action in mind um, and more people needed information on this priority we'd have to do some more digging to see if that was relating to the way that the question is phrased because it could be a little ambiguous um, or what that might be but that can be for the subcommittee to discuss and dig into Loneliness, including issues relating to isolation and mental health. Now, no one had an action in mind, but I do know that this has come up several times um, in discussion. So maybe it's um, something that we all need to talk about or that the subcommittee needs to talk about to get to the point of an action. But one person did suggest that it should not be a priority for the committee. Now, we're going to contrast that with the next question which is loneliness, including issues related to isolation, mental health, and drug use. Now, no one thinks that that should not be a priority and someone has an idea for an action. So I look forward to the subcommittee digging into that and helping to guide the committee with the work there. Vaccine hesitancy, obviously a big uh, cause of concern um, we can, oh, there seems to be a consensus that we can conceive of the committee taking an action. One person does not believe that it should be a priority for the committee, and one person um, has an action in mind. So this is hesitancy, which is addressing vaccination concerns so that people voluntarily get vaccinated. And we're going to compare that to vaccinations, suggesting policies that motivated to get vaccinated despite their concerns. So more people have thoughts on um, an action that the committee can take. No one believes that this is uh, an inappropriate priority for the committee. And uh, some people need information and roughly half can conceive of us taking an action. Okay. This is, you know, this is uh, how I spend my downtime. Sit with the data, figure out what's, what the difference is between these slides. Now, access to dentistry. More than half of the committee feels it needs more information on this priority. Now, as a co-chair, one thing I can tell you is this was really interesting because in the past we had several conversations relating to access to dentistry, um, but we did not take any action as a committee on those items. And now perhaps because so much time has passed since we've had uh, an expert come in and educate the, commu the committee on the issue, we're like, oh, we, we need someone to come back if we're gonna take this on as a priority. Access to healthcare services aside from dentistry. Uh, lots of people need more information here. 
Now, um, keep in mind, however, that this is somewhat related to the racism questions relating to access to healthcare services. We had ideas there, not necessarily ideas for the general population uh, to receive access. At least that was my reading of the data. I should I should have said that at the beginning. This is all Jerome's personal reading of the data after too much coffee. Um, the subcommittees will be able to take their own insights uh, from the data. Okay, a lack of mental health services pro providers for young people. Someone's got an idea and I'm excited to hear it. A lack of culturally competent mental health service providers. No one has an idea, but everyone uh, can conceive of something that we can do or needs more information. Okay. Oh. oh, Anna's got a question, and uh, I'm going to let Laura do that. Let's do questions in six slides, please. <laughs> because the slides take up a lot of real estate on my screen. But go ahead, if you've got them, put them in the chat, um, and then Laura will uh, help us navigate them in six slides time. Um, sexual exploitation prevention. Someone's got a, a, an idea. A lot of people need more information on the priority. Public safety. Uh, this is the one I was saying seems similar to criminal justice reform. A lot of people have uh, can conceive of us doing something on the topic of public safety. Uh, some people need more information and someone's got an idea in mind. I'm excited to hear what it is. Air quality. Uh, please ignore this little dash here. I was hovering over that slice of the pie when I took the screenshot. It doesn't mean anything. Um, one person does not believe that air quality is something that the committee should consider as a priority. There can be a thousand reasons as to why that is. But we are very evenly split as a committee as to who needs more information and who can conceive of uh, the committee taking action here. Oh, and then we're back to racism. I apologize, Anna. I put you um, on pause for six slides, but it turns out it was only three slides. So, um, Laura, what was Anna's question? Yeah, so Anna asks a good question. Now that we have some data, are we going to do a little bit of reforming slash reconfiguring subcommittees so that they have a little bit stronger alignment with the things that we've kind of selected um, as kind of high priority in terms of readiness to act or can conceive of an idea? So that was her question. And I think that can be for everyone to kind of figure out for themselves. No one's going to force anyone to be in a particular subcommittee. Um, everyone's self-identified at the time and now having more information if you'd like, to, if you identify something else. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, now you all should have received a copy of the slides and they're not pretty but there's a lot of information in there. <laughs> so um, I wonder if anyone, and this is just putting it out there, if anyone who said they did have an action um, for a particular priority uh, wants to raise their hand and speak up, that will be fine. Or if anyone has a thought as to why something should not be a priority um, and they want to go ahead and uh, articulate that reason, now that would be great. Right. And I'll put my hand down now before I forget. So I saw that when it came to discussion of other drugs that weren't part of the opioid category, that there were people in the committee who felt like they needed more information on this. Mm -hmm. And I am a chemical health counselor. I do a lot of consult service. So if folks do want to reach out to me on an individual level outside of the meeting just in the sake of time to have a discussion to learn more i'm more than happy to do so because we are seeing like fentanyl and it's 
the two really do go together more than being a separate category at this point, because um, as we know, fentanyl is an opioid. And what we've been seeing for the past three, four plus years is in other drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine and crack that there's a fentanyl proliferation in those drugs as well. And we've been having discussions with people about testing their stimulants and any other drugs for fentanyl and having the discussion around how to do that so they can be more educated and be safer when they are using. Because I've also been working with patients who've been having opioid overdoses when they haven't intentionally been using opioids. Thank you. And I think I saw in the chat that Anjali also has volunteered to help provide the committee with uh, medication information. Additional thoughts on the data in general? Any surprises? Any disappointments? Anything you'd like for? Oh, yeah, Britt Brit is happy to join forces. Um, Margaret, I see you got your hand. Yeah, so I was just going to say at, or add to what Britt was commenting on and then what Anjali is offering is that, you know, there is a lot of expertise on this committee and part of what we can do as an action, especially in these spaces where we're looking for more information is actually have our committee members you know, provide some sort of a presentation on that particular topic. Um, and, you know, uh, I've mentioned this before, you know, we've even had like a panel discussion, you know, where, you know, maybe there is uh, somebody else in the field of, you know, opioid response that, you know, could be a voice added, you know, to provide more information to the committee. So, you know, we certainly can think about those kinds of actions that help increase our own knowledge and then uh, be able to, yeah, using this data, figure out, you know, where is a space or a place that the committee makes an action or takes action and or maybe not, you know, because that's part of the learning curve. Britt, your hand is back up. It truly is. Um, and <laughs> Because I also noticed that there was that more overwhelming response for um, addressing opioids. And I think we're very used to hearing about opioid epidemics and it's opioids, opioids and overdoses and all that. And totally fine because that's what a lot of people are used to hearing. And I know, I have a feeling that actions that people may have in mind, and I could be wrong, this is just my assumption, may have a lot to do with Narcan and Naloxone access. And I don't love being a bearer of bad news, but we're at a point, and this was just in the Washington Post the other day, and they interviewed people from harm reduction organizations all over the country, including Southside Harm Reduction in Minneapolis. We're getting to the point there's a naloxone shortage. So that sucks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing other hands. I'm going to stop presenting. You all have that, uh, you all have that deck sent to you. I'm also going to email you uh, the data as well. And then I wanted to get your thoughts on um, potentially a next meeting being more of a working meeting for the subcommittees. Okay, good. Good. We will, so we will not be issuing another survey next next month. That's great. <laughs> but then to Anna's um, question, uh, just from uh, a technical perspective, Patty needs to know ahead of the meeting who goes into what breakout room. So if you are going to, you know, try the sorting hat on again and put yourself into another group. Um, please let us know ahead of next month's meeting uh, so that we can just get that down uh, in an email form to head. Wonderful. Okay, uh, seeing no other questions, let me pull the agenda back up. Oh, we have let a me, membership. Oh, yeah. Oh, while you're doing that, I'll just say, um, you know, it, 
when I send out the meeting reminder, you know, which in this case was yesterday, you know, you could even respond to that and and maybe Hattie and I can figure out or between Jerome and Laura and Hattie and I, we can figure out, OK, who was in which breakout room and actually provide that list to you, because then I, maybe mm. you don't even remember who was in that breakout room. Um, but that way, you know, if you decide that you want to join a different breakout room, you know what what you, uh, room you were in originally. And I believe that, thank you, Margaret, you're right. I believe there are also some people who did not break out into any particular room. So this might be another chance for them uh, to choose one, should they so desire. Okay. Um, but, well, Margaret, you're actually next on the agenda. Right. So I will attempt to share. We'll see how this goes. Hmm. Let me try again. Is it the terms document? Yeah, oh there it is. Oh. I didn't I didn't have it open and up on my th I was like why can I not see it <laughs> okay let's try this one more time da, 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 da. here we go all right you should be able to see the 2021-22 member term summary is that true that is true okay fantastic so every year at about this time I provide this information to the committee because half of the seats every year have the opportunity to turn over. So if you have decided the committee isn't for you and you want to resign your position, you certainly are welcome to do that. Um, or you can re-up, you know, so you are eligible again for joining the committee for another two-year term and I just wanted to offer some explanation about this because this can be a little bit confusing. So every committee member has the opportunity to serve three consecutive two year terms. And for some people, that means that they serve a total of six years. For some people, so I will uh, highlight Fatima and Alicia, for instance, um, were and maybe even Wanda and Anjali on this particular list were actually appointed just I feel like earlier this year so they may have just been appointed instead of uh, at January 1st of 2020 they may have been appointed in 2021 for um, beginning their term but you filled a term, you filled a seat that may have been vacant for a different reason. So perhaps that person resigned and then that seat was left vacant until we were able to advertise for that seat opening. You were able to turn in an application. We were able to go through the city council to get you appointed. And because 2020 was so many other things, it also was a year where um, um, advisory board appointments were on hold. So there were a lot of seats that were that felt very vacant during 2020 because um, the council had decided and the city clerk's office had decided they were just not going to do any appointments during a particular period of time while everything was shut down. They were trying to figure out all the technology, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you may have begun your term in 2021, but you're actually filling a seat that has a very specific term for two year period. So I hope I didn't make that muddier than it needed to be. But what this means is that this fall, you do need to reapply for 
uh, your seat if you're interested in continuing on the committee. And of course, I always hope that everybody is interested in, in continuing on the committee. So you'll notice that on this uh, uh, form as well, that KJ Starr and um, Craig Hedberg are not eligible to re-up because they are already in their third and final term, which means at the end of this year, we'll have a little certificate for them, thanking them for their service um, you know, during these past six years. And their seats are what I always refer to as like true vacancies because they can't, um, they're, they're just not eligible to re-up into that seat again. I do know that Craig is already in contact with people at the U of M um, to find a replacement for himself, which is fantastic. For any of the ward seats, um, those actually are decided by, the decision is actually made by the council member, but anyone is eligible to apply. So what will happen at this point is there will be an announcement on the, um, on the city's website that announces that there are openings on the Public Health Advisory Committee. I wanted to have this conversation with you now so that you're not freaked out like, what do you mean? I'm sitting in this seat and uh, I intend to stay on the committee. Totally fine. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, click through to the links and I'll actually email each individual person and provide you with the link. If you want to reapply, you can um, send in your new application. We will route it to the uh, city council member that you were appointed by. I also encourage you to reach out to your council member and to say, I am serving, I'll just pick on Laura, uh, you know, I am serving in the Ward 11 seat. I am really interested in reapplying to to continue to be on the Public Health Advisory Committee, and I just wanted to let you know that. Um, they appreciate that kind of communication from the advisory board members. Um, a lot of times the council members may ask you some questions, you know, related to that, like, um, you know, well, what has been, you know, one of the accomplishments that you feel the committee has done, or what do you think is a health priority that um, needs to be focused on? So they do appreciate that kind of engagement from the members. And so, um, so if basically, if your name is on the top half of this form that I emailed out to you, it does mean that you will need to take action. And that action will come in a form of an email from me providing you with the link to um, reapply. And then I, I kind of take the ball from there. So once you get your application in, I'm notified by the city clerk's office and then I can make sure it gets routed to the right people. Are there any questions about that? And yeah, I'll I just want to make sure. I'm up for my, am I going to be up for my third term already? Is that what, is that supposed to say? Oh, sure enough. Yes, and I have Laura's wrong too. Yeesh, that's I was crazy. so excited about second terms that I just like kept right on going. So yeah, so Anna Arkin would be eligible for a third term. You and Laura would be eligible for a third term. Thank you for correcting me on that. <laughs> I know. Oh, and it looks like Terri Ann Jones as well would be eligible for a third term. Well, okay, thank you very much, Margaret. Yeah, any other questions about what this process is like? I yeah, Britt. Right All right, it just felt easier than to hit the hand. So I know that I am in the middle of two terms and I know that we have a mayor's election coming up. So what does that usually look like if there is any change in who is going to be the mayor? Mm. For yeah, I was going to ask that same waiting. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for this. I was going to ask the same question around the timing given. Yeah, that council member two from my ward is is up. Yep. Yeah, that's those are great questions. 
in my experience um, with the PHAC and with the electeds, they typically, if somebody is interested in being re-nominated, re-elected, reappointed, they're like, great, okay. <laughs> let's get it done. I have rarely found uh, an instance where a council member was like, no, I don't want that person. I want my own person in there. You know, it's like they don't really fully always understand what the process is, you know, to doing that. And so most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, if they have a person that is interested in continuing to serve, that's what they um, they lean towards is, you know, just saying, great, let's get you reappointed. Just wanted to check because I live in Ward 2, so I'm just like, should I just go for KJ seat at this point? Just but Right, which actually you could do. So there can be some movement, you know, between the seats, um, which is also like another great question because, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, yeah, so when there's sort of a regular Ward seat available, um, you would just apply for that particular seat instead. And then, of course, I would route it to Cam Gordon instead of to the mayor. Yeah. Thank you. And anybody can do that. Yeah. Any further questions on your term? Okay. Well, we've got about 14 minutes left in our allotted time. And when uh, Margaret, Laura, and I were emailing, we were uh, just kind of noticing that, you know, that we look like we're heading towards another peak, and that kind of brings a level of stress. Um, certainly upon all of you professionally as healthcare professionals, um, and then on uh, all of us as human beings. Um, and so I just wanted to, from uh, Laura and Margaret's idea, create some space, if you want to share what your organization is doing um, regarding this time um, or whatever you want to talk about. Uh, I will also mention that those emails I promised to send out will be very lighthearted and easy. I will not be trying to add to your workload during this time. Um, I see Laura's hand and then Britt's hand. Thanks. So I will, I've been trying to figure out the best way to kind of share messages I could use um, help from the group um, and thinking about this um, kind of information to the community. Uh, what we're experiencing in the healthcare and those who are in the systems, you know, chime in, I think with your experiences that you're seeing, but working at one of our local health systems, our workforce shortage um, is at such an extreme level that we are not going to need much. And in fact, we're already experiencing this. Um, it's not taking much to really push us over a threshold. So when this all started, you know, we were worried about a big wave and that um, kind of taking our systems or toppling our systems over. Right now, we're noticing just little blips are toppling us um, because of our workforce. And so my the PSA I <laughs> want to share to the broad community, of course, you know, is about protecting ourselves um, from Delta, you know, getting vaccinated, masking, the normal message, but it's also the broader message of please take care of yourself, please make good choices, um, please don't drive recklessly right now, please <laughs> um, do your right things to stay healthy and well, because we are really worried about just taking care of basic um, things that folks are coming in with. We're not going to have, um, and it makes me kind of emotional to think about it, but we're not we're not going to have our normal uh, service and care um, for things. And so we're really concerned that people don't have a situational awareness of that um, and that they feel like, well, these are just little blips of Delta. And it's like, no, that's not it. We're really, um, we're really in dire straits right now, I think, as a healthcare community. So how we as a PHAC can help share that message, I would really be grateful because I'm worried people don't know um, that we aren't doing well um, and won't be able to serve like we normally would. So 
would appreciate help with that. And I'm absolutely going to piggyback off of Laura's sentiments. Um, I don't really get to follow as much news as I'd like to, so I'm not sure how much of the bed availability and surge status is being reported on locally or anything like that. But we've had several days the past few weeks at Hennepin Healthcare where we haven't had beds. Um, we've had people who are direly in need of admission that we see in our clinic, and we try to do we've tried to coordinate some direct admits from clinic. And there's been times when that's not been able to happen to go from the clinic to an inpatient bed as, you know, it's a, there's multiple things that go into helping somebody avoid needing to go to the ER because the ER is a stress too. But unfortunately, if we can't do a direct admit, they still need to do a detour into the ER. Um, the staffing challenges have existed even before vaccine mandates came up. And I know that there's definitely people who are trying to uh, cast the staffing challenges as being part of vaccine mandates, but these are two separate things because people got burnt out last year, even before vaccine was getting rolled out. Um, healthcare professionals and nurses and bedside staff, their mental health and physical health has suffered from the long hours, lack of relief, um, not always having the safest staffing ratios, and then just continuously watching people die. And at this point now, it's just from something preventable. Um, we do have some overflow beds that we rolled out, but those aren't going to exist if the staffing doesn't exist. It's a two-pronged thing where it's like, or a multi-pronged thing where the physical bed itself has to exist in a room, and we need to have the staff to safely care for the person in that bed. But on top of all that, what HCMC has been doing um, with the staff too is rolling out more initiatives towards health equity. So I am really glad, I'm really proud of HCMC that acknowledging that health equity is vitally important for the care of our communities is important to continue to discuss as we are dealing with the Delta variant and we're not even a state that has experienced what other states have in regards to the variant and hospital stuff. The Delta variant hasn't really fully impacted our health systems. This is just our normal wear and tear of end of summer. The accidents, the heat strokes, um, the drug overdoses, which have been astronomical the past couple of years, and just anything else that usually adds to a peak in hospital census around this time of year. And we also have people who are COVID patients and that number may continue to grow as that, when you look at the maps of how the Delta variant spreading and how it impacts hospital systems as the red starts to really close in on our area. So hearing that, I wonder if the committee would be willing to send um, a quick email to your council person if you like for instance i know that mine sends out a newsletter um either every other week or every month and just with that quick message that you know our healthcare systems are more taxed than you might be hearing about please be careful um you know normal yeah. things could turn into emergencies just due to where the system's at right now you utilize the other options that are there if possible um they're like, unfortunately, the HCMC did close the urgent care, but there's there are other urgent cares available in the city for urgent mm -hmm. needs, like getting a strep test or if you have a UTI. If you have a primary care provider, being able to connect with them to see if there's an acute care appointment or any other way to get seen by a medical professional that day or the next day, if it's something that doesn't feel like it needs to be an ER visit, there's orthopedic urgent cares in their own separate like almost triage ER type spots like through TRIA. So if people have broken bones, seeing if that's an option for them, on top of just being more careful if possible to hopefully avoid the need to be hospitalized. Um, Anna asked if the city already has messaging on this. Laura says that she hasn't seen any. Margaret, have you? are you aware of any messaging that the city might have? I'm actually looking at their at the city website right now, you know, which, of course, then you have to go through a variety of 
clicking, you know, to see like what's actually there. So I will do some digging. Um, I can put the city website address in the chat as and it takes you right to their COVID-19 uh, page. So and then there's a variety of things that you can kind of self select. The other thing is that the um, public information and outreach branch under our uh, incident management structure had created a social um, media, a social media toolkit. And I can look through those messages because those are already in other languages. They're, you know, relatively simple um, messaging. I doubt that it would deal directly with some of the concerns that you raised right now in terms of like bed shortage and, you know, finding care, you know, at your local clinic as opposed to going to the ER, but there may be other messages that, you know, could be helpful. So I'll take a look through that as well and um, make sure that I send that out to you. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Laura and Brent. Are there any other thoughts while we have this space? Yeah, I would love to hear, you know, how others are either responding, you know, to sort of this environment. Um, and that could even include things like, you know, going back to in-person meetings. Um, so I can share with you that because the city council extended the mayor's um, emergency declaration, uh, we as a as the advisory boards and commissions will not be expected to go back to in person meetings. Um, and so I'm pretty convinced that it's that's going to stay that way for some time. But I'm wondering what others are experiencing. Or questioning. Okay. So okay. like no one's raised their hand. Um, you know, one of the collaboratives that I sit on for the city is a collaboration with Hennepin County, which includes, you know, healthcare, health plans, housing providers, you know, a variety of mental health providers. Um, and we were supposed to have uh, an in-person celebration for grantees that we had provided money to uh, to do projects in their own communities on um, housing stability and community mental well-being. And, um, it, you know, it looks as though that in-person celebration is, of course, going to have to get postponed. Unfortunately, you know, as many of you know, grant doors, so the funders, you know, have specific deadlines and it's possible that we won't be able to have any sort of an in-person um, celebration with them uh, before the grant year ends. And so yeah. I'm kind of sad about that because, you know, we've we've all been working, you know, remotely as have they. Um, and, you know, it would just be so great to be in person and be able to thank them for all the great work that they've done. Well, I look forward to a future where you're able to safely express gratitude in person, share some joy and share some delight. It'll be nice. Amen. Oh, at 7.59, I am delighted to give you all one minute of your lives back. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Every moment so counts. Every little moment counts. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, if you want to come on, you just even say your goodbye.